So working with your family should be easy, right? I mean, we're family. We know each other, we have commonalities, there's trust there, we have the same blood. This should be easy, this should just flow, this should just work, right? So, how come it's not working the way we thought it was supposed to work? It's because you need these 10 tips that I'm getting ready to tell you for how to work with family and ministry to make it better. Watch the video. Don't go nowhere. Keep watching. So you made it through the intro music. So that means you are interested in hearing these 10 tips on how to deal with working with family and ministry, working with family and ministry. It can be a great thing. And for all the great reasons, but for some of those same reasons can make it very challenging to work with your family and ministry. So I'm going to go through these 10 tips that will help make the experience not so bad and actually help us to grow in working with our families and ministries, some things to understand, how to approach the situation and how to make it easier. So let's get into tip number one. Tip number one is to understand and respect each other's natures and personalities. A lot of times in family, we tend to forget or not realize or not think about in the ministry because ministry is business. Yes, it's about souls and salvation, but church itself does have the business aspect that a lot of times people forget and don't think about each other's natures and personalities in these things. This is for the leader. This is for the non-leader. This helps us, if we know this person's nature, it helps us know how to approach the person, how to approach the situation, how to respond and be effective. As leaders, we know our team's personalities, we know their strengths, we know their weaknesses. You know the one who is gonna be a go-getter and get right on it. We know the ones who are going to stop and think and pause and need to pray on it. We know the ones who just ain't gonna show up and ain't gonna do. So to save everybody some frustration and triggering things, assign the right things to the right people. We know how we are as leaders. They know how we are. And just because we're family, we know how each other is. Don't assign stuff or don't approach one family member with something that you know they ain't going to be able to do. You know their nature. You know their personality. Respect it. Not trying to change it. Not trying to force them to be more like us. Deal with them where they are. You can still talk to them as a level 10, even if they're not acting as a level 10 right now. Even if their nature may not be our 10. That could be their 10. Just because our 10s are different and look differently doesn't make it wrong. Respect each other. Respect the nature. This one is not good at this. I'm not going to ask them to do that. But they will be great at this over here. So this is what I'm going to ask them to do. Because that fits their personality. That fits their nature. That fits their makeup. Tip number two for working with your family and ministry is to keep it professional. Like I said earlier, ministry and church is business. Everything is not all hallelujah, glory, glory, speaking in tongues. There is the business part of church that often gets overlooked and over spiritualized. Keep it professional. At church, we are not family. I know it sounds funny, it can sound harsh, but at church in ministry, we are not family. If I'm in a position of authority over you, you are not my relative at that moment or time. You're just not. You're so and so. Your sister so and so, reverend so and so, elder, minister. Use each other's professional ministry titles. This way it sets boundaries. Everybody understands and knows that here, this is not play play. This is work. At my church, my father is my pastor. When we are in ministry mode and in church, I'm not walking up to him calling him daddy. It's pastor. Respect. My mother is first lady. I am not just walking up to her calling her mommy. She's also a reverend. I call her reverend lady. She can't stand it, but it's a sign of respect. Others call her Miss First Lady, call her Miss by her first name. Those are all okay. But when you're in family, just walking up to them in ministry, just calling them whatever you want to call them, family nicknames, you don't want to do that because then it blurs lines. It crosses lines. It shouldn't be. We This ain't Robin Thicke. We don't want no blur lines. 
mm -mm. we don't want any of that we don't want that set the boundaries keep it professional number three is to respect each other's roles and responsibilities in churches, there are different ministries, different departments, different heads of those departments. There's pastors, there's associate pastors, there's ministers. Everyone has their roles and responsibilities. And in family, if we want this to work well, we need to respect each other's roles and responsibilities. Simple as that. If this person is, is in charge of this, Nobody asked you to come over here now, putting in your two cents of what should be and how it should be, and it should be this way. You're not in charge. And if they didn't ask you, if they didn't leave space for them for you to add your two cents, just respect what they're doing. And if you do have issues and concerns, you voice it in the appropriate way. You don't go to other people in the department and in that ministry now and you want to voice your venom and how you feel while bashing the person who's in charge because that doesn't help the situation. All it does is it causes division and those little small foxes are what spoil the vine. So now you have this department or these departments over here and you got this person doing all this talking and spreading all this negativity and how they feel and it should be this way and it should be that way. And all you're doing is tainting and skewing the view of those people. Respect each other's roles and responsibilities. People are in charge of certain things for a reason. Whether you agree with it, whether you like it, whether you think things should be done differently, Respect it. Respect their job. Don't go overstepping bounds just because you think it should be done differently. Because you wouldn't want it done to you. Respect it. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Because if you're in a position or leadership or in charge of something, you wouldn't want somebody else coming in now, dictating how something's supposed to go, making rules and decisions on the side of what's going to do and how they're going to do and just think they're going to trump you. It's rude. This goes in line with the last tip. Tip number four is to clearly define roles and responsibilities. You have to. If there's no clear definition of what the person's supposed to be doing, what you expect of them, you're going to get chaos. And then you're going to find yourself frustrated because this person is not doing what you want them to do. But how would they know what you want them to do if you have not clearly defined your expectation of them? If you have not clearly defined the job description and the role and what they're supposed to be doing, you have to. With family churches especially, because there's that familiarity and that commonality and you can be more lax sometimes when it's your family, you have to clearly define their job. What is their job title? What is the position that they're going to be doing? In that position, what are you expecting from them? What is the outcome you're expecting? What are some things set in stone that they must do in that position? What areas and what things do they have liberty to kind of interpret and free reign, so to say? As long as it's still in lines with the vision and ministry of the church and what you're expecting of them. Those things have to be clearly defined. Otherwise, it's going to be confusion. It's going to leave too much room for interpretation. And then everyone's going to be frustrated. And then the person who is in the position is going to feel like, oh, they're being micromanaged and I can't do anything. Because they really don't know what it is they're supposed to be doing and what the boundaries are. You have to set boundaries. Clearly define what it is you're expecting of them, what you want them to do, what you're expecting the outcome to look like, and what areas that they have the green light to use their creative license. What they can do without your permission, what they can't do without your permission. Define it. They have to know it. Tip number five is to write it down. Get it in writing. Write it down. What's the vision? What's the ministry? What is our purpose? Write it down. When you're working with family and ministry, sometimes we get it mixed up that we just because we're family and we do understand things and nuances about each other. Sometimes we just get it mixed up and misconstrued that, oh, they know what I mean. They know what I'm trying to say. Not necessarily. And sometimes we do, but sometimes because we're human beings eat and with different thought patterns, how you're saying it and what you mean by it might not be how what I'm hearing you say, how I'm interpreting it. Write it down. What do you mean? If I'm in a paid position in the church, contract, write it down, sign it. 
What are you expecting from this person? That way there leaves no room, even volunteer positions, contract, some type of agreement. Write it down. Sign it. You have to. Have to. This leaves no room for the I didn't know. Oh, I don't remember. You never told me that. It's in writing. You agreed to it. You signed it. Write it down. Please. Writing it down also frees the person who may be in the leadership position or the pastor, whoever has the license to replace or remove people from positions. If it's written down, if it's signed, especially in this day and age and the way things are going, signing it is a form of legal binding. You read this. And even if you didn't, your signature says that you read this. You agreed to it, that you were going to follow these things and you were okay with these things. So if it ever comes to a point of needing to replace this person, this covers you as the leader, the pastor, whoever. It covers you, whether they're family or not. You agreed to this. You signed it. So now if I need to replace you, you agree to it. Number six, pay your people based on the role that they are in. Don't get me wrong. I know and understand every ministry cannot afford to pay every person who works in the ministry, who volunteers. I understand you cannot pay everybody. And I understand there are certain ministries who can pay, but they can't pay everybody. They can pay certain positions. If your ministry is in a place where you can pay just because their family doesn't mean that they should have to work for free. Pay them for their time and their expertise. This doing it as unto the Lord and because I'm working for the Lord and for church, it should be free. That mindset is very old fashioned and I don't necessarily agree with it. I'm not leaving this up to debate it or argue it. I personally do not agree with because you're doing something for the church that it should be free. Now, if you choose to not accept money, that is your choice and that's okay. But I don't think the expectation that because you work in a church and because we're family and we work in this church together, that you should just be able to do this for free because it's still this person's time. It's still their expertise. It's still a whole lot that goes into it. Musicians, they have to be at rehearsals. They have to be at services. They are on duty the entire service. And that's a lot of times what people don't realize. And that's just one area or one department because in most churches, that's typically the only position that is paid is the organist or the keyboardist or whoever the main musician is. But there are other departments that also have their roles in the church. And if you can afford to pay them, family or not, pay them. And also family, if you are paid staff at the church, make sure your skills and expertise are worth the money that you're charging to be paid. Because that's not cool either. You're expecting to be paid this grand amount, but the work that you're producing. And not only the work you're producing, eh, you're not putting any efforts in to make it better. So why should they pay you? It's, Balance. You want to be paid? Produce work that's worth what you want to be paid. Don't want to be paid up here and produce some work down here and then think that's just the way it's supposed to be. Just being faithful alone is not enough just to get paid up here but still do work down here. You wouldn't do that in your natural job. If you work in ministry, work for the ministry, pay position, even volunteer positions. A lot of positions at the church are volunteered, but that doesn't mean, oh, I should just come up and show up whenever I feel like it, how I want to feel like it, how I want it. That's not cool either, because if you're going to be like that, then don't do it. Don't do it. If we volunteer at some charitable events outside of church, do you come with that same attitude? Do you just, oh, I just show up when I want to show up, do what I want to do? A lot of times we don't because it's something that's near and dear to us. It's something that we care about and we want to show our compassion and we want to show our support. Same thing in the church. If it's a position that you agree to and you're not being paid for it, you should still be doing it as if you're paid. Otherwise, don't accept the position. Tip number seven is to invest in the resources which will help you support better communication. 
a lot of times in churches, communication is not the best. And it's okay to pay for a therapist, pay for whatever you want to call them to come in and foster and teach you how to better communicate with each other. Sometimes it's necessary. Just, oh, praying about it is not enough. It's okay to need therapy. It's okay to have a professional come in and give you support, give you tools on how to do this better, on how to better communicate with each other, how to hear really what the other person is saying. It's okay. Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes we can't do it in and of ourselves. You can have all the leadership things. You can have all the conferences. You can have all the seminars. You can have all the meetings. And sometimes the meetings are not enough. Invest the money to have somebody come in and teach you how to do it. Not every person is good at communication. They're not. Not every pastor is great at it. Not every pastor knows how to do it. Not every member knows how to do it. Not every leadership head or ministry head knows how to do it. And that's the time. And if it's a situation where you cannot invest the money into it, find other ways. Are you having consistent meetings? Because communication is big in church. The church cannot effectively get to where it's trying to get to if you do not communicate effectively. You need meetings. Start there if you're not having them. Consistent meetings, church meetings with the whole church, department meetings with the department heads. You need to have meetings. You need to communicate with each other. And once it gets to the point where that's still not working, it's still not helping and you can't afford, then afford to have somebody come in and help. Communication is needed. And if it's not there, especially in family churches, the church is going to suffer. Get the help that's needed. It's okay. Tip number eight is to learn from old family patterns. A lot of times working with your family in church, there's a lot of old habits from family that don't real you don't realize are there. Learn from them. Le growing up, I came from a family church. I'm still in a family church. If you watched my other video, my uh, PK experience, if you haven't, go watch that. It explains more, a little bit of my background and my testimony, but I'm in a family church. My father is the pastor. My grandfather was the pastor before that. Almost everyone in my immediate family is in some type of leadership or ministry position. Father's the pastor. Of course, my mother's the first lady. My mother is also a minister. I have relatives that are musicians. I have relatives that are also ministers in the church. I have relatives that sing and do. So we're all in ministry together. And a lot of times, old family patterns and old family dynamics spill over into how you do church. Which can be a good thing and which can be a bad thing. But you have to recognize those and see those and know what things need to be adjusted and changed and what things are the good things. Let's expand these. Let's grow on these things. If you come from a family that does not communicate well or doesn't communicate issues or problems and everybody just goes on like they don't see it or never address it or never talk about it for whatever the reasons are that you don't, that shows up in ministry. Because then you go into a ministry where nobody communicates with each other. Nobody talks. People have issues and problems, but nobody says anything to the person that it needs to be said to. They go and talk to everybody else. And I already told you earlier in the video, all that does is cause division. So pay attention to the old family patterns. If you know in your family y'all don't communicate well, start doing it. Find a way to do it. Okay, we don't communicate well, so this is an area I know we need to pray about. We need to get the resources and the help to fix this and then move forward. But if y'all are great at levity, if y'all are great at making people feel welcome, if y'all are great at other things, then hone on those things. You can use your family experiences in ministry, the stuff that's not good, you can tweak and adjust. The stuff that you are really good at, use those things in the ministry and grow and expand them. When my grandfather was the pastor, he was great at love and unity and making people feel included and not wanting people to be left out. And he was great at making church feel a certain type of way. 
whether people were upset or angry with him or not, he was still really good at making church feel a certain type of way. Family has a history of that. Use that. It doesn't mean just because it's in the past and they did that before that we can't still use it. You don't have to do away with all the old things. There could be a new way to do it. And some old things just keep it the way it is if it's working. And grow and expand in other areas. But pay attention to old family patterns. Look at what has worked and find ways to continue it, grow it and expand it. Look at the things that aren't working that are spilling over into the ministry and find ways that we need to tweak this. We need to adjust this. And it doesn't have to necessarily be communication. I use it as the example, but any family patterns that are good in ministry and that aren't continue what's good grow out of and process and figure out how to adjust and change the things that aren't so that we can turn them into being an asset in the ministry and not a hindrance. Tip number nine is take breaks. It's okay to take breaks. Whether it's taking a vacation from the ministry for a day or a week or whatever. If it's not from the ministry, it's okay to take breaks from your family. Don't get me wrong, your family is always your family, but in a lot of ministries, we see some of these same people multiple times a week at church. And then we still have to see some of these same family members at family functions, and sometimes it can be a lot. Sometimes you just need a break from each other. And that's okay. It's okay to skip one or two or three or 10 functions. It's okay. And it doesn't mean you're mad with each other. Could it mean that you're tired of each other? Yes. And that's okay too. We're human beings. Just because your family and ministry doesn't mean everything's going to be honky dory all the time doesn't mean you're always feeling like being in the mood for each other all the time. If choose your battles, if you know I can't just get away from y'all at church, then you can take a break from them with the family stuff for a little while. If you just need a vacation all together, I need a week away, no church, don't want to see y'all either, that's okay too. But go about it in the appropriate professional ways. It's still if you're in a position of leadership, put in your vacation time. Don't just send texts and call in mornings of the night before you're about to leave saying you're not coming and you ain't going to be there for a week. That ain't cool either. Because you wouldn't do that to your boss in your natural job. But you're allowed a vacation time. You're allowed vacation. You're allowed breaks. It's okay. It's okay. And the tenth and final tip for working with your families and ministries is to exit gracefully. What do I mean by that? Sometimes when you're working with your family and ministry, and you've tried and exhausted all tips, all things, you have prayed, you've gotten the resources that you needed, you've had the conversations, and sometimes it's still just not going how it needs to go. And if you're in the position of leadership, it's okay to replace. It's okay to fire. Exit gracefully. Because more times than not, if the person is being removed from the position, they are not totally oblivious as to why they were replaced. We need to get over this stigma that if somebody's in a position in church, they need to be in this position for a hundred years. And the only way they get out of that position is if they die. Sometimes replacement is not because they were doing anything wrong. Sometimes it's just time for a shift, time for a change. The ministry is growing, going in a different direction, a new dimension and need newness. Having the same person doing the same thing for a hundred years. It's a hundred years old now. It's okay to grow and adjust. Exit gracefully. And if it's to a point or if it is necessary that you need to leave the church, do that gracefully as well. Follow whatever your protocols and procedures are for your ministry to leave and do that. Leave peacefully. Don't go trying to be destructive and tearing up stuff, tearing up stuff with your words and your actions, because all that does is not only further damages the ministry, now it damages, damages your relationship with the family. 
Thank you guys so much for joining me for this episode of Soulful Sundays. 10 tips on how to manage working with your families in ministry. I really hope these tips were helpful. Leave me a comment. I'm going to say this every video. Leave me a comment. Let me know if these tips were helpful. Let me know if you tried any of them. Do you guys have any other tips that could be helpful? Any things that you learned while working with family and ministry? I'd love to hear it. And as always, 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 guys, please subscribe. Hit this bell notification so that you know when next video go live. And I will see you in my next one. Have a blessed one, guys. Bye.